Assalamualaikum. I'm uh, Kashmira Nagda. I'm a robot Muslim. I'm a student of Final CA. My question is actually uh, in the first part of your lecture, you said there are no contradictions in the Quran. Okay, but uh, there is a ayah in the Quran which uh, the number I'm not aware of, but uh, Allah says in the Quran that He seals the heart of certain people and hence they do not understand. But we all know that it is the brain that thinks and the mind. Can we clarify that? The sister asked a very good question, and I'd like to congratulate her to thrive for a word into Islam. <laughs> she said, she said that Allah says in certain parts of the Quran, and I do agree with her that Allah seals the heart, mohar lagai on the heart, and so that people who don't come close to the truth, they have been sealed. She asked the question that today science is advanced and we know that brain is the main organ required for thinking, not the heart. Previously people thought it was the heart. So isn't there an error in the Quran? If you realize, in the beginning of my talk, I also quoted a verse of the Quran, the third quotation, verse from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25, 28, which says, Rabbi Shohali Sadri, Sadri, Oh my Lord, increase my breath for me. Rabbi Shohali Sadri, Vaya Sinli Amri, Wahlal Ugdata Millesani Yafkao Kauli. Increase my breath for me and make my ta task easy for me and remove the impediment from my speech so that they will understand. Now hear the word again, Sadar, heart. So why should Allah increase my heart? The Arabic word Sadar has got two meanings. One is heart and the other is center. If you go to Karachi, you will find Sadar so-and-so, Sadar so-and-so, center so-and-so. So Sadar in Arabic, besides meaning heart, also means center. So here Quran says that we have sealed your centers, brain. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbi Shrohali Sadri, O my Lord, increase my center, intellect, and remove the impediment between me and the audience. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Khalid. Dr. Sakir, is it not contradictory that the Quran calls Iblis an angel in one place and a jinn at another place? I will just pose the question that doesn't the Quran contain a contradiction when it says that in several places Iblis was an angel, but one place it says that he was a jinn. The Quran mentioned about the story of Iblis and Adam may peace be upon him in several places in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, in Surah Araf chapter number 7, in Surah Hijra chapter number 15, in Surah Isra chapter number 17, in Surah Kahab chapter number 18, in Surah Taha chapter number 20, in Surah Saw chapter number 38, several places. And in all these places, I do agree that the Quran says, we have said to the angels, bow down. All of them bow down except Iblis. This is the English translation. We said to the angels, bow down. All bow down except Iblis. But one place in the Quran, the brother did not give the reference. He was referring to Surah Qaf, chapter number 18, verse number 50. Which says, we said to the angels, bow down. All bow down except Iblis. Iblis was among the jinn. So if you analyze, seven places the Quran says, Iblis was an angel. One place it says, Iblis was a jinn. Isn't there a contradiction? This is the English translation of the Holy Quran. But the Quran was revealed in Arabic. And in Arabic language, there is a grammar known as Taglib. Arabic grammar known as Taglib, in which if the majority is addressed, if you address to a majority, even the minority is included. I'll just give you an example. If I suppose there are 100 students in the class, out of which 99 students are boys and one is a girl, and if I say in Arabic, all boys stand up, even that girl will stand up because she knows the rule of taglib. But if I say in English, all boys stand up, only the 99 boys will stand up, the girl will not stand up. So the Quran was revealed in Arabic. And when the Quran says, we said to the angels, bow down, all bowed down except Iblis, it shows 
that the majority of the people that were there were angels. Iblis may be an angel, may not be an angel. But Surah Kahaf chapter number 18 verse number 50 says that he was a jinn. So Quran says in Surah Kahaf chapter number 18 verse number 50 that he was a jinn. And the other places it says maybe he was an angel or not an angel. We have to agree with Surah Kahaf chapter number 18 verse number 50. It's not a contradiction. You have to apply the rule of Arabic grammar taghlib. And secondly, the angels don't have a free will of their own. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they immediately obey. Jinns have a free will. So this is the second proof that they believe for the jinn. I hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Now we believe that God is supernatural and He can do everything. A non-Muslim friend of mine has a question. Why is it that God does not assume a human form? Can you please explain? The sister posed the question that God is supernatural. He can do everything. And her friend posed the question, then why can't God Almighty take human forms? The people who believe in God, they say that God is supernatural. Everyone out here who believes in God will also believe that God is supernatural. I would like to know which person out here who believes in a God says that God is not supernatural. Everyone. Everyone who believes in God, they believe that God is supernatural. Supernatural means there is nature and then there is God. In fact, according to the Quran, God is not supernatural. God is not supernatural. According to the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, God created nature. It will never be that nature said this and God is saying the opposite. God created the nature. God created a fitra, the innate nature in the human being. One of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the Quran is Fatir, which is the name of the 35th surah of the Quran. Fatir has been derived from the word fitra, meaning innate nature. Fatir means the creator, the originator of creation, the creator of the primeval matter to which more creation is added by God Almighty. Therefore, when we break our fast in Ramadan, we say iftar. Iftar means break. Same way, the word fatir means creator. It means shaper, former as well as splitter. Quran tells the people that don't you see the, I, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't you ponder on them? Look at the sun, look at the moon. They are following the laws of nature. They will never change their course. They are all natural. Same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too natural. It's mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 62, it says, Walan tajid, Walan tajid, that the nature, Walan tajid, Nisunatillah, Tabdila, that you will never find a change in the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Azab, Chapter number 33, verse number 62. A similar message is repeated in the Quran saying that established the handiwork of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never will you find a change in the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a standard religion, but most of them will not understand. Mentioned through a room, chapter number 30, verse number 30. Today science tells us the quantum and the modern science, they tell us that without an observer, you don't have anything. The universe without the observer is useless. The scientist posed the question, who was the first observer? Another attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ash-shaheed, the witness. Quran says, 
Allah was the person who first witnessed. So, God is not supernatural, God is natural. Regarding the second part of the question, that God can do everything. Normally, I pose this question to most of the people who believe in God, just so that they have a better understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask them the question, that can God create anything and everything? Most of them will say yes. Can God destroy anything and everything? All will say yes. My third question is, can God create a thing which He cannot destroy? And they are trapped. If they say yes, that God can create a thing with which He cannot destroy, they are going again in the second statement that God can destroy everything. If they say no, God cannot create a thing which He cannot destroy, that means they are going again in the first statement that God can create everything. Again, they are not using the logic. They are trapped. Same way, God cannot create a tall short man. Yes, he can make a tall man short, but no longer he remains tall. He can make a tall man short, no longer remains tall. He can make a short man tall, no longer that man remains short. But you can't have a tall short man. You can have a medium man, who is neither tall nor neither short. But God can't make a man who is tall and short at the same time. Similarly, God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cannot make a fat thin man. There are a thousand things I can list, which God Almighty can't do. God cannot tell a lie. The moment he tells a lie, he ceases to be God. God cannot be unjust. The moment he is unjust, he ceases to be God. God cannot be cruel. God cannot forget. You can list a thousand things. God Almighty cannot throw me out of his domain. The full world, the full universe belongs to him. He can kill me. He can obliterate me. He can make me vanish. But he cannot throw me out of his domain. To him belongs everything. Where will he throw me? He can kill me, he can obliterate me, he can make me vanish, but he can't throw me out of his domain. Nowhere does the Quran say, God can do everything. In fact, Quran says, In the laha ala kulle shay in kadir, that verily Allah has power over all things. Quran does not say God can do everything. Quran says, God has power over all things. Several places. Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 106. Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 108. Surah Imran, Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 29. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 77. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 1. Several places the Quran says, In Allah ala kulle shay in kadir. Verily, Allah has power over all things. And there's a world of a difference between Allah can do everything and Allah has power over everything. In fact, Quran says in Surah Buruj, chapter number 85. Verse number 15 and 16, it says that Allah is the doer of all he intends. He, whatever he intends he can do. But God only does godly things. He does not do ungodly things. Regarding our main question, why can't God take human form? Posed by a non-Muslim. This philosophy of God taking forms is called as anthropomorphism. That God Almighty takes forms. And they have a beautiful logic. That for God Almighty to say, to know, to instruct the people, how it feels when a person is hurt, he had to take a form of a human being. To, to tell to the mankind how it feels when you are hurt, how it feels when you are happy, how it feels when you are sad. To lay down the do's and don'ts for the human being, God Almighty took the form of human being. Known as the theory of anthropomorphism. But if you analyze, this logic does not stand the test. Suppose I create, I am the inventor of a tape recorder. I create television. I don't have to become a tape recorder to know what is good and bad for the tape recorder. I don't have to become a television to know what is good or bad for the television. I just write a catalog that to play a cassette, insert the cassette, press the button play, the cassette will start playing. Press stop, it will stop. Press fast forward, it will fast forward. I put down a catalog. Same way, God need not become a human being to know what is good or bad for the human being. He chooses a man amongst men 
to give the instruction, to give the catalog. Which is the catalog? The Quran. <laughs> the catalog for the human beings, the do's and don'ts, what is good for them, what is bad for them, is the Quran. He does not have to become a human being. Why? You ask me. Can't God take human form? Yes, he can take. But the moment he takes the human form, he sees it to be God. Because God is immortal. Human beings are mortal. You can't have an immortal and mortal person at the same time. It's like a tall short man. <laughs> human beings, they have certain qualities. They have wants. For example, they have to eat. They have to eat. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 14, Say, will I take for anyone as a protector besides Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who feeds everyone but is not required to be fed? Human beings required to eat. God requires to eat? No. Human beings required to sleep. It's mentioned in the Quran in chapter number 2, verse number 255, in the Ayat al-Kursi. No slumber can seize him, no sleep. God does not require to sleep. So if you have a man, man requires to sleep, man requires to rest, man requires to eat, how can God come down and be mortal and immortal at the same time? It's illogical. If you say that God takes human forms and has human qualities, you are giving a whip to the atheist to beat you with. The moment you say God is supernatural, God can do everything, you are giving a whip to the atheist to beat you with. God is not supernatural. God cannot do everything. God cannot do human forms. God is natural. God has power over everything. He is the doer of all he intends. And he does not take human forms. Uh, my name is Austin Phillips. Uh, I am a Christian. Now there are many questions I would like to ask, but I know time will not permit. So. Uh, most, uh, can we have the most important question put? Yeah, the most yours. important question now I will ask is uh, what, I com what comes to my mind right now is this that, the, that Islam uh, speaks about Jesus Christ. Islam uh, believes that Jesus Christ was, it doesn't believe that he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead, but it believes that he was raised up, Jesus was raised up uh, by God. It, uh, it, does, it also says that Muhammad was not raised up. I think I'm right. Somebody told me this. Muhammad was not raised up. Jesus was raised up. And one Muslim friend also told me that Islam believes that Jesus was born of a virgin and he was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was not born in the natural way. Now this proves that Jesus Christ, if he's not God, at least he's greater than Muhammad. Now why, why don't you consider, if you have the teachings of Muhammad, why don't you give the teachings of Jesus also which are there in the Bible? Uh, can I put another question associated with that? Uh, it's from Harold Porter. He also asked, if you say that God is one, then how did Jesus Christ come into the picture? The brother asked a very good question. And these questions are mainly posed by the missionaries, Christian missionaries. I don't know whether he's one. And he gave some two, three examples. That Islam speaks about Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him. And he says that the Quran says that Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, was raised up alive. Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was not. Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, was born of a virgin birth. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had a mother and father. Who's greater? The mind gives the answer. Who's greater? Jesus. And then he says, and there are many such questions. It also says, it says, the Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, is mentioned 25 times. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa only five times by name. Who's greater? And the post questions. The post questions are the Muslims. And our mind thinks, ah, who's greater? Jesus Christ may peace be upon him. So he wants me to throw some light on Jesus Christ may peace be upon him. Brother, Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus may peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus may peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe 
that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians do not believe. We believe. We believe that he gave life to the death with God's permission. We believe he healed those born and dying with God's permission. But there are parting of ways. We don't believe that he's God Almighty. We don't believe that he's the begotten Son of God. We believe he is the messenger of God. Coming to your question, if the Quran mentions that Jesus cast may peace be upon him, what is the life? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. Who's greater? Doesn't indicate that if there is someone after God, it has to be who? If someone has to slaughter someone, if someone has to sacrifice, we have to sacrifice the best person. And according to them, the best person is Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him. According to the Quran, he was not crucified. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. We agree. But according to your Bible, according to, according to the false reading, the Bible also says he was not crucified, that the Jews crucified. Most of the people did not accept him to be a messenger of God Almighty. They went to extreme. Quran says, La taghlu fi dinukum. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171, it says that, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, La taghlu fi dinukum. Do not go to extremes in your religion. What extreme? Two extremes. Jews said he was an imposter, and the Christian said that he was God Almighty. Extreme. Speak not of God or but the truth. What? Speak the truth. There's only one God. He was raised up because there was misconception. In a second coming, he will not teach us anything new. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, On this day have I perfected your religion for you, and have chosen for you Islam as the way of life. <laughs> the Muslim, we believe will come, but he will not teach us anything new. He will not teach us anything new. He will come to clarify the misconception. And he, and he will tell to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah bari ta'ala, you be my witness that I never told them to worship me. I never told them to call me the begotten son. He will come for the Christian, not for the Muslim. We believe he will come. You say that he was born of virgin birth. If suppose, if suppose a person does not have a father, and you claim because he does not have a father, he is God Almighty, Quran gives the answer in Surah Imran, Al-Imran. Chapter number 3, verse number 59. The similitude of Jesus in front of Allah is the same as Adam. They were created from dust and say, be it was. Adam may peace be upon him. Did he have a father? Adam may peace be upon him. He had no father. He had no mother. If you say a person who does not have a father is God Almighty, Adam may peace be upon him is a bigger God. <laughs> Your Bible, it's, it's, it's not the Quran, it's the Bible. Bible speaks about another superhuman, King Melchizedek. King Melchizedek. He had no ascent, no descent, no beginning, no end. He is bigger than even Adam, may peace be upon him. See, the Quran gives the answer. Quran gives the answer. You say Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, is mentioned by name 25 times. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa only five times. Why? Because there were allegations against Jesus, may peace be upon him. There were no allegations against Muhammad, may peace be upon him. And... When the Quran was revealed, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was present. So if I have to address a person, I have to say he, the, O Nabi, O Prophet, I need not take his name always. But if I am referring to my friend who is not here, I have to take his name. That Mr. X, Y, Z. So since Jesus, may peace be upon him, was not there when the Quran was revealed, his name had to be taken. In that, in that way, Quran mentions the name of Musa, alayhi salam, one, three, two times. Does it mean he is greater than Prophet Muhammad and Isa, alayhi salam, both? No, because they were not present when any example is given of them, their name has to be taken. For a person who is present, the, the name need not be taken. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, we would like you to note that we would have the Zuhar prayers after the program in Jamaat. You could join Dr. Zakir, all of us, those who would like to have Jamaat. We'll, maybe we'll have a bigger Jamaat if you are cooperate outside in the mosque. The next question... Uh, from the lady said, now we will start a session. I think there are more, uh, much more quantity of uh, brothers here than the sisters. We would have, uh, now I would change the system, let the ladies be asking a question, then a uh, gents here in a clockwise fashion, then again another brother will ask a question here again to the ladies. One chance to the ladies, two chance to the gents, so that we balance the number of people waiting. Thank you. 
Assalamu alaikum brother Zakir. My name is Ishra Ansari and I'm a science graduate presently doing my MA in Islamic studies. My question to is uh, in the Quran it has been mentioned that no one besides God knows the sex of the child in the mother's womb. However, modern sciences have developed certain tests by which you can determine the sex of the child in the mother's womb. Is this not a discrepancy in the Quran? Wa alaikum assalam sister. She has posed the question that the Quran mentions that no one besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the sex of the child in the womb. And today I do agree with her that there are many medical tests, for example, amnio sentences, ultrasonography, which can determine the sex of the child. So isn't there a mistake, a scientific error in the Quran? What the sister is referring to is referring to the verse of the Quran from Surah Luqman, chapter number 31. Verse number 34, which says, Only Allah knows the hour, that is the day of judgment. No one besides Allah knows the day of judgment. When will it rain? What is in the womb of the mother? What will a person earn? And where will he die? These five things, no one besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. The main question is, that Quran says, that no one besides Allah knows the sex of the child in the womb. Sister, the misconception is because there are a few translations. There are a few translations, especially the Urdu translations, which have mentioned that no one besides Allah knows the sex of the child in the womb. In the Arabic text, the sex is not mentioned. The Quran says, no one besides Allah knows what is in the womb. The Quran does not refer here to sex. It refers to how will the child be. Will he be honest? Will he be dishonest? Will he be a boon for the society? Will he be a bane for society? What will he become? Will he become an engineer? Will he become a doctor? And believe me, with all your medical scientific knowledge, you can never tell in advance what will a person be. That is a mistranslation. Before the next question comes. That's a very good question. He said that it, it can be... Please don't interrupt, brother. What do you want to say you can come in the mic, brother? It is better if you come in the mic and say. Still, I give him a chance. Maybe the non-Muslim, no problem. He's saying, maybe I'm misleading. If there's a difficulty in understanding the language, go to the lexicon, the Arabic lexicon. There are Arabic lexicon written by non-Muslim, and the best one is Lane lexicon. Go to the Lane's lexicon written by non-Muslim and they will tell you the sex is not there in the Arabic text. They will tell you, not I. <laughs> Regarding other criteria, what about Day of Judgment? There are people who predicted. It had come in times of India that in November 1992, there was a Korean church which said that the world is going to end in November 1992. All the people who followed that church came there. Nothing happened. We are yet living, and the people ran away with the money. No one knows when the world is going to end. Regarding rain, some people will say, science has developed. By weather forecast bureau, you can say where it's going to rain, when it's going to rain. You know how, how accurate the rains are, how accurate the weather forecast bureaus are, especially in India. Okay, some may say, America, America, they're perfect. Okay, for sake of argument, agree. Give them rope to hang themselves. The Weather Forecast Bureau, when they tell you when and how much is going to rain, they tell you on the basis of looking at the clouds and analyzing what is the speed of wind, when it will fall. It's nothing great. The rain is already present in the cloud. It is like you telling me, uh, suppose a person sits for an examination and the results are going to be out after one month and the teacher corrects the patient, the teacher corrects the paper after three weeks and she knows in advance that this person came out first. This person got 93 marks just because she knows in advance. It's nothing great. She already corrected the paper. So just because before putting on the notice board, if she says one week in advance, who came out first, it's nothing great. The rain is already present in the cloud. The great part will be if the Weather Forecast Bureau can tell today when and where is it going to rain exactly 200 years afterwards without looking at the clouds. I challenge any more any weather forecast bureau to say in advance, 200 years in advance, 
where which part of the world exactly how much is going to rain they will never be able to do it regarding where will a person die some people can say yes see i will commit suicide i will die here most of the cases of people who commit suicide they fail majority how many people want to commit suicide hardly just a negligible amount and those majority of the people who try to commit suicide majority are unsuccessful after they take poison they go and tell somebody else then they rush to the hospital when they jump they see where there is a safe landing and even if you jump if allah wants to save you he can save you if you die it's with his permission not without his permission <laughs> regarding the last point no one knows how much he's going to earn you may say see brother zakir i know that i earn 2000 i earn 2000 rupees a month the quran is wrong the quran does not talk about earning here in money it talks about taksib the word taksib in arabic can also mean earning good deed and bad deed it does not only mean salary and even if you say that i give charity of 100 rupees you can never know how much how much sawab you are getting how much blessing you are getting you will never know how much blessing you'll get by doing a good act and how much sin how much negative points you'll get by doing a bad deed everything is kept intact in the record of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hope that answers the question thank you and uh, excuse me now uh, because uh, the management said we have to shorten the program by another 10 15 minutes uh, just to give a chance to those who have given slips at least one or two chance i should give when they have sent me such a huge uh, list of slips i would put one question from the slip then a question from the brother then again from the slip then from the uh, other brother then from the sister and so on so that uh, we maintain the rules of the auditorium i would put this uh, and the question is uh, you know that arun shauri has written several articles and books against islam why don't you challenge him to a public debate the person that posed the question that i know arun shauri has written several articles and books against islam why don't i challenge him for a debate and i have read those articles most of the articles are mainly based on two points one is talking about the women that the women don't have the equal rights and secondly is about that islam is a terrorist religion it's a merciless religion and a few points here and there like the one the brother mentioned god does not know math etc let's analyze believe me all of them as i mentioned out of context mistranslation misquotation there yes, that's what brother said that i can clarify it that's what i'm doing the brother saying with him we would like the audience you have maintained a very good decency we appreciate that please be seated the question posed was why don't i challenge arun shuri for a debate if you written so many books against islam if you read the latest book on the world of fatwas sharia in action latest book it was just released in bombay just a week ago i think just a few days ago and i was able to read that book and there if you read the back cover on the back cover he has given a beautiful emblem of a certain arabic quotation of the quran which is from chapter number 48 surah fatah verse number 29 which says muhammad may peace be upon him is the messenger of allah and those who follow him are firm and unyielding are uncan uncompassionate towards the unbelievers but have love between the believers full stop full stop as the no full stop again quoting out of context giving the impression that muslims we are merciless against the unbelievers he is quoting out of context if you read the context it starts from surah fatah chapter number 48 verse number 25 which says that these unbelievers were the one who did not agree with the revelation of the quran and they prevented you from entering the sacred mosque 
and prevented you from sacrificing the animals and prevented you from reaching the place of sacrifice. These unbelievers prevented the Muslims from performing the pilgrimage. I want to know that suppose any Christian is prevented from entering the Vatican City, will he love that person? Will he embrace him? But natural, he will not like the person. If suppose a Hindu is prevented from entering the place of his pilgrimage, Banaras, will he like it? No. The same way, if you read in context, it says that these people who prevented you from entering Makkah, the sacred mosque, and prevented you from sacrificing the animal, you have to be firm with them and love those people who are the believers. Putting out of context, and in that book, as I told you, if you read on page number 571 and page number 572, he quotes his favorite verse, very favorite, his pet verse of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, which says that after the four, four forbidden months have passed, seize the unbeliever, in bracket, indicating seize the Hindus, seize the unbelievers and slay them. But if they repent and if they give charity, if they pray, let them go. Indicating that every Muslim, whenever he finds a Hindu, slay him, kill him. But if he accepts Islam, let him go. Again, he's quoting out of context. Out of context. The context is from Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 1. There was a peace treaty between the pagans of Mecca and the Muslims. This treaty was unilaterally broken by the pagans. So Allah gives a warning. Put things straight in four months or a declaration of war. And during war it says that during war, when you, fight, when you find these unbelievers who have broken the peace treaty, seize them and kill them. Suppose the President of America says to the soldiers of American, the American soldiers, that during the war between Vietnam and America, wherever you find a Vietnamese, kill him. It will, if I quote that today and say that the American president said, kill the Vietnamese wherever you find him, it will sound that he's a butcher. I'm quoting out of context. In context, but natural, the leader of the army or the president will always say that when the enemy comes, don't get scared, fight. It boosts up the morale. So what is wrong if Quran says that? And then on page number 572, from verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7, 8, 9. Verse number 6 is skipped. You know why? Verse number 6 gives the answer. It says that if any of these pagan, if any of these mushriks, these unbelievers, if they ask for asylum, give it to them, so that they will hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and escort them to safety. Quran does not say give them asylum. Don't let them go. Quran says escort them to a place of safety. These mushriks, even though they don't accept Islam, if they want asylum, es don't just leave them. Escort them to a place of safety, which, which army generally say that when the enemy wants, if he wants to leave, escort him to a place of safety. Which army? I want to know which general of any army today will say that if the enemy wants peace, don't leave him, escort him to safety. This is what the Quran says. Quoting out of context, the favorite topic, that Muslims are merciless out of context, all verses out of context. And the second favorite topic, and these verses, similarly, these verses were also quoted by people like Tasnima Nasreen. You ask me, why don't I have a debate with Arun Shuri? I had a debate on the topic of Tasnima Nasreen, organized by the Bombay Union of Journalists, press debate, organized by them. And in that debate, when I told them, I want to video record the debate, the Bombay Union of Journalists did not give me the permission. And you know what was the topic? The topic was, is the religious fundamentalism a stumbling block to the freedom of expression? Talking about freedom of expression, but hypocrites, they don't allow me to tape. Why? I 
I promise them, I promise them, I will give you an unedited copy of that cassette to you. They didn't allow me. After a lot of pressure, finally they allowed it. And know what happened? By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the people were out at making Islam the scapegoat, making Zakir a scapegoat. With the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, it was not my genius. It was his help that the debate was a very successful one. So successful, so successful that not a single paper reported. Not a single paper. In the debate, from the Christian side was Father Pereira. From the Hindu side was Dr. Vaid Vyas. From the Islamic side, I was there. And there was Mr. Ashok Shani, who translated the book Lajja into Marathi. The topic was Tasima Nasreen. If this cassette was not there, who would have known about it? Today, lakhs of people have seen it. Not only in Bombay, throughout the world. Lakhs. If the thing was not recorded, who would have known about it? And the second topic about women, Arun Shuri. All the answers are given in the cassette. There are two parts. Part number one about the lecture and part two, women's rights in Islam, modernizing out the part two. It clarifies most of the misconception that people, including Arun Shuri, have about this. Regarding, would I like to have a debate? Is he worth debating? Is he worth debating? He's not worth debating. And if he wishes, he can come for a debate. I am all games. Ehlan was Ehlan. Ehlan was Ehlan. But in public. I will debate in public with a live video recording. In public. Not just in a closed room. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Uh, we are really very sorry. The management is not, has three said no further going on. We have to close down. I thank all those present here, Mr. Rafiq Dada, our distinguished guests here, all of you. You'll have made it a very interesting evening for everyone present here. Inshallah, those who'd like to ask questions could come at the Islamic Research Foundation and carry on with this. Every Sunday we have regular programs. You could come to ask your questions. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair for the program. Thank you. Shukran.